let me introduce Stefan Hoyer, who will be talking about X-ray, extended arrays for scientific data sets. And he is a quantitative researcher at the Climate Corporation, located in San Francisco, where he builds statistical models for weather, weather climate, for agronomic applications. And he recently graduated from Berkeley. So let's welcome him. All right, hi. Um, so my name is, uh, again, is Stefan Hoyer. Uh, I'm going to tell you about an open source project that uh, we started recently for working with uh, labeled multidimensional arrays in Python. Um, and the slides for my talk, I just tweeted them with the PyData hashtag. So if you're curious, you can follow along or see the, the, the notebook. Um, so I wanted to really briefly introduce uh, uh, the Climate Corporation. That's where I work. So I'm a, a scientist. I work mostly on a team that deals with weather data. Um, but what the company does is uh, provides uh, data-driven uh, uh, advice to, uh, to farmers in agriculture to help them make decisions like when should they plant, uh, how much fertilizer should they put on, um, sort of day-to-day -day decisions that they can, we can sort of use uh, a, lot of, a lot of data and a lot of agronomic modeling and sort of weather modeling to give them, uh, uh, to give them advice about um, how they can uh, improve their operations. So we work with a lot of data, and I want to show some of the data sets we work with. Um, so that's sort of the motivation, in part, for uh, this project. So we work with uh, a radar data set, which is uh, like weather radar, for which me measuring rainfall over the whole United States. This is a data set from the, produced by tiling together a bunch of radar stations um, by the National Weather Service. Um, we look at gauge data, which is sort of more sparsely structured, but it's like a like a rain gauge in somebody's backyard, or not backyard, but at a weather station. Um, and, and then we deal with <clears throat> data that comes from uh, numerical weather forecasts. So these are sort of uh, systems that are run on giant uh, supercomputers, or the, the, basically the bulk, well, the, many of the world's biggest supercomputers are used to make weather forecasts um, and to run these like weather simulations. Uh, so we, we make use of these sort of data sets, um, and they produce a, a lot of data. Um, and it's sort of very, very rich data. Um, and then we also work with, uh, a lot with uh, satellite images, which can give you a sense of like exactly what, uh, if, so to use, um, yeah, so we, we can actually see fields and uh, see how well they're growing from, uh, like from space or also like from, uh, say from airplanes. You can get a lot of information that way. Uh, all right, so we, uh, so I, I'm a big fan of Python and, um, in particular, I guess I don't need to tell you guys this, but the Pandas library is really awesome for working with data in Python. Um, it, ha it sort of ha takes care of a lot of things that make it, your life a lot easier as a, as a scientist doing data analysis. Um, and particularly things like how it handles uh, missing data, how it sort of automatically aligns data. You can keep track of labels and a few other things like, like, the way it, like time series or these like group by operations are really handy. Um, and of course, the biggest thing is that it interoperates pretty nicely now with sort of the uh, sort of a uh, family of other libraries that are sort of in the PyData ecosystem, and Pandas works with them. So it's kind of becoming like a, a sort of standard type for working with uh, labeled data, which is, which is awesome. Um, now, here are some of the data we work with. Uh, so these are um, a data set that's five-dimensional weather forecasts. So you have uh, sort of a couple of traditional dimensions. So this uh, with like a, like a latitude and a longitude dimension. And then you have like a time dimension also. You're forecasting for different days. And then with weather data, you run the, as soon as you run the, you make a weather forecast, you start your supercomputer up again and start making a new weather forecast because you have new data. And you want to uh, predict, make, you know, make a new prediction. So that's another time dimension. And then there are actually probability forecasts. So you try to understand the systematic uncertainty in the weather. So they run the model a bunch of times in parallel as well. And that gives you, uh, that gives you a, a sort of a weather scenario axis. So I have a five-dimensional array of data. Um, and it's, uh, it's all labeled data, which is nice. That's sort of what, what we would hope that something like, like Pandas would excel at. Um, it's pretty big data. I mean, in many cases, we can subset the data. But, I mean, but uh, largely it comes, I mean, there are really uh, oh, hundreds of gigabytes or more of, of, of this data. Um, and it's all, so of course, it's, it's sort of, comp it's uh, stored in these uh, very compressed, like, b binary formats. Um, and it's, again, it's high dimensional. So it's not immediately clear how to put it into an object that pandas can handle, like a data frame. So I wanted to sort of 
show you sort of the options we thought we sort of uh, went through. So first of all, Panitas has this, this object uh, called a uh, n-dimensional panel. You, pr you may or may not have seen this, but it's uh, well, partly because it's a little awkward to use. You have to make you, basically, the, this is straight from the pandas docs, actually. And the way that you make an n-dimensional panel is you, you make your own factory to make uh, n-dimensional panels, and you sort of supply all of these, um, uh, all these, these uh, you have to supply a lot of like, sort of label-based information. And then some other things like a statistical axis. That, like, so it's a pretty awkward setup. Um, and it also, it doesn't, at least in the current implementation in Pandas, it's not very good for doing math. You can only add a scalar value to, a, to an n-dimensional panel. Um, and it's not really, uh, it's not quite uh, sort of the structure we're looking at, look, we, we'd like to have for multi-dimensional arrays. Um, so sort of the, other, the other option would be to, to put things in a, a sort of a, a more of a, a sort of a one-dimensional object. This looks more like a, a tabular data set, like what you would expect, uh, like, like sort of what Pandas, is, I think, is, a little, uh, this is, is really well designed for. Um, and uh, so you can make it like a series and you can sort of label out your observations. Uh, and, and it is a nice way of representing data, but it's not uh, fundamentally uh, multidimensional. So it doesn't, it, it, so you, you sort of lose uh, some nice aspects of, of being, we'd like to be able to work with really n-dimensional arrays. Um, so, so that's, so, all right, so what we want. Uh, so we were looking for uh, a data structure that is a, uh, like a NumPy multidimensional array, but they can also make use of, uh, of metadata, and that is, uh, right, so, just, so sort of like pandas, but for really n-dimensional. Uh, so especially like features like how panda, pandas handles uh, missing data, how it handles, um, and how it handles, uh, so pandas also labels this data. Now one, one significant difference uh, is that we, between what you can do in pandas and what, what we would like, is we would like to be able to label the dimensions with names. So I can say I have a time axis or like a latitude axis. In pandas, you have, always have an index or columns or you can give like numerical uh, axis numbers. Um, that's what you can do. You can do that in NumPy also, but that's not, but ideally we'd sort of put all that information in there and that would let us make more powerful tools that can, make you, that can automatically be aware of the metadata. Um, and another feature which is not a little tangential to these other aspects is we want something that can work okay for handling uh, data sets that are too big to fit into memory sort of at least, uh, so sort of going towards working with big data. Um, at the very least, I should be able to uh, load a file from disk, sub and, or rather open a file on, on my disk that's maybe many gigabytes, and say I want to select out a particular subset of that file to work with um, without having to load the entire, uh, the entire file on disk into memory, which is probably impossible. Okay, so this, that's sort of the context for this new project, uh, X-Ray, which is, uh, I'm pleased to say we re I released the first version of it uh, yesterday. It's uh, open source on uh, GitHub. Um, and so we want, right, these labeled n-dimensional arrays. Uh, and the other, uh, the sort of the, the uh, major goal is we wanted to sort of uh, leverage sort of all this knowledge we have about how to work with these sort of arrays and all these tools that already exist. So especially pandas. Um, so we reuse the uh, pandas has uh, an index object, which makes it, uh, which uh, works really well for, I guess, if you want to, to label uh, uh, tick marks along, uh, along a particular axis of a dimension. Um, and uh, so we, we, we reuse that, uh, that object from pandas. Um, and we also try to copy the, the API from pandas. Um, and of course, we want to interoperate uh, smoothly with the rest of sort of the scientific Python community um, in you know, PyData, so we want to be able to sort of send our objects, turn them into something that, like a native pandas object, or sort of convert them back the other way. Um, and the other aspect is that we wanted to build, a, uh, uh, build it around a data model that uh, we've seen has been very successful in the geosciences, and this is uh, the, the NetCDF file format. Um, so I'll get, kind of get into what that, that means in a little bit, um, but it's a very nice way for, uh, for working with, lab with uh, labeled multidimensional arrays. Um, so I really wanted to mention there are a few other projects that have made attempts to, or that have done sort of labeled, uh, labeled array data in Python. Um, there is a, a, a data array project, um, which was sort of never really got beyond a, a prototype stage. Uh, there's, there's another library, Larry, which uh, is not, um, 
which is sort of not fully self-described data, doesn't have label dimensions, and sort of just similar things to what Pandas does in some sense, a little bit different, but still not quite what we want. Um, there's this, this library from the, the UK Meteorological Office, uh, IRIS, which is, uh, which is very good if you have like extremely sort of well-labeled data that's like uh, for like, uh, like earth science specific. If you have, if you have all the units are labeled and you are very careful about maintaining your metadata in the right way, it works great, but otherwise it's, it's not. And then of course there, there's also Continuum has the Blaze, which I'm optimistic will eventually have the, uh, will uh, we'll be able to interoperate with or will um, have good support for uh, labeled uh, arrays as well. Okay, uh, so before I get into show you a demo, I wanted to briefly, uh, briefly describe the, the data model that we use. Um, so there's a, the, the, the sort of two first class, or two main objects in the public API for X-Ray. And the one object is a, a data array object, which is a, uh, it's the labeled multidimensional array that I described earlier. And the main sort of distinguishing features are that it has labeled dimensions. So you can, again, so you can aggregate on like the time dimension. Um, and it has a, a homogeneous data type. So it's not, you, you can, if you make an array of type float, it's only floats. There's no like different columns at different data types. Um, you, you, should, you can make a separate array if you have different data types. Um, and then there's another object to, to contain these, ob these, uh, these arrays called a data set. And the data set uh, is a, a dictionary-like container of the arrays, um, and it keeps track of shared dimensions and, and coordinates so that you can uh, share a dimension like the time axis between different arrays. And that turns out to be very handy. Um, and then we also can keep track of, the other thing we add is the ability to keep track of any extra metadata you want in the, in the form of a, of a dictionary, which, the, which is called uh, an attribute in the, uh, in the parlance of uh, the NetCDF or like the HDF5 uh, file formats. Okay, so now for the, uh, the demo. Let me make this readable here. And just a second. Um, Great. All right, I will be brave and do a, my, my live demo. Is this, is this big enough to read in the back? Yes, okay, great. Um, so again, we are on, uh, this here. Um, you know, this is all, uh, you can download this online later if you like, I tweeted the link. Um, all right, so we're on zero, point one of this library, which we just released. Uh, so the main, so the sort of the main way that you get data into X-Ray is to make a, these data set objects. Um, and essentially the, the, one, the one, one aspect that, uh, again, that, that, that you're required to do is to label your dimensions. So when you pass objects into one, a data set, you pass in, um, uh, sort of the, the simplest way to make something is to pass in tuples of, that uh, pass in a dictionary of tuples, which label the dimensions, and then give the array values. Uh, so here I passed in a couple, I passed in a, ti a time dimension and my, a, a time variable and a foo variable, and I get back, I see that I have a, a data set object, and I'll add in a few more variables here, um, which has a collection of arrays. So the array, the, 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 the different, um, so the, the, the coordinates here are the equivalent of, are the, are correspond to the dimension names. Uh, and the, the, and the, the non-coordinates are the other variables that are in my data set. Um, so I, I have a, few, a couple of labeled objects in here. And again, the data set is a, a dictionary-like object, so I can uh, do all the dictionary methods to verify that I, have, uh, a, that I have an array foo in my data set. I can look at the keys in my data set. It's just all, the, it's all, all these uh, arrays that are listed on the left. Um, and I can look at one of the values. And so I see that the time, uh, the, uh, the time array is a, um, it's this data array object, and it consists of uh, the main, basically there's a, there's a NumPy array in there, which is a NumPy datetime64 array, um, and then it's, it has also this, uh, it's, it's called time, and it exists along the time, the time dimension. That's how you, you, uh, you specify something as existing along a coordinate, is you give it the dimension, its dimension is equal to its name. Um, and that's, uh, that's how you say that's how I wanna label things along the time dimension. I have another variable here. So here, it actually, it, it created the space variable for me uh, as, a, as my coordinate, because I gave something with a dimension of space, but never actually specified what this, the space array was. Um, that's similar to pandas uh, without handles indices. And there's my data. So it's a, 
It's a two by four uh, like array of some, some random numbers. Okay, and I, again, I have all the, the dictionary stuff you would expect. Um, so I can, st or the attributes are just an ordered dictionary where I, I can put in some extra metadata here and it, and it adds, I'll add in um, some, it adds in some metadata which is like saved along with the array. So this is uh, sort of a handy way to like say save information about the provenance of data um, in a, in a self-contained way. Um, okay, so now the, the data array object. Uh, so again, these are sort of the items inside a data set. Um, and they have these labeled dimensions and, and lab labeled coordinates. Um, uh, here, I'll get that, take that object out. Um, it's like a pandas object in the sense that it's a wrap around a NumPy array. You can just do uh, the name of my array dot values, and that gives you out a NumPy array with all the values inside, in, uh, inside this data array. And they also have these dimension labels, which is a, a, a tuple, of, a, a tuple of strings. And this describes, sort of gives you the, the sort of the combination of these two sort of give you, uh, describe, uh, specify, uh, I guess, how the, uh, how the array interprets different operations. Um, and, they, and they can also keep track of their own attributes. So indexing these arrays works mostly just like it does in a, in a NumPy. You can access, or, and essentially, uh, for most of the simple cases, um, so I can access, say, like the first element along a certain dimension. I can say access a slice. I can do a, a, a you can use an array of labels to, to index along one of my dimensions. Um, this is just, just by integer-based indexing. Um, and because we have the, the labels, uh, the, the labels along each dimension, I can also do, uh, I can also do location-based indexing. And here I copied the syntax from, uh, from pandas, where you, if you do array.loc, uh, that gives you, that says, I want to do location-based indexing. And you can see that you can put in a string, again, this is, borrowing the machinery from pandas for a date and it sort of automatically can convert that into uh, the, the right place to look up values in the array. Um, so the other sort of nice thing about, because, because we labeled the, uh, the dimensions, is I don't need to, to just specify the, the, the order of the, uh, of, of the dimensions in the array, spec uh, tell me how I'm, apply I'm going to, to index it, but I can also uh, give them uh, by name explicitly. So I can say I want to index it by the, um, the space dimension, a certain item, and then the time dimension with, with using a function. And I can also do that with the labels as well. Uh, and so sort of the nice thing about that, that actually extends to working with data sets as well. So I can index all the arrays in a data set uh, to grab out a particular value. Here I, I made them all sort of size one, but it still has the same, same items. Or I can take a particular label, like say, uh, grab everything from, uh, from this particular date, and you see every every array in the data set was sliced out um, based off of um, uh, based off the label, and I'm left with, for example, a scalar time dimension, which is the one time value that's left w uh, by applying that, that slicing. Uh, you can also put these uh, can, sort of stack these together using you, 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 uh, using the, the metadata. Say I want to stack them along a, this new dimension li label. Uh, that's kind of what you'd expect. You can do the same thing for stacking. You can stack both the arrays and you can stack the, the data set with the concatenate methods. Um, you can also merge in another, another data set into a an existing data set and that will sort of automatically check for, for conflicts so that you can, uh, you don't um, uh, remove any data. Now, the part that I'm really excited about is how the data array works for, for math and what you can do with that. So the, the basics of the mathematical operations work just like uh, like I do in NumPy or Pandas. Uh, you can uh, you can add or subtract scalars or NumPy arrays. You can actually use uh, NumPy universal functions and get back another data array. Um, like uh, here, I am using NumPy's sign function, and you can also have some methods like transpose, for example, to, to switch dimensions. And there are a few other a few other examples of NumPy-like methods that we've we've copied here. Um, so for I guess an excellent example is that we've added labels to operations like sum. So I can sum on the time axis just by doing uh, dot sum and then putting time. Um, or I can give a, like a, a list of different dimensions to aggregate over. Um, and then, ah, okay, so then, uh, so then when you're doing mathematical operations, so one thing that, uh, so I'd like to show you is, we, uh, so NumPy has uh, support for, for broadcasting which, is, which lets you uh, add, uh, do, say, add two arrays, even if they don't have the same dimensions or the same, uh, the same length along each dimension. You can still add them together. So we, do, we can do something like broadcasting, but it's actually more powerful with the labels. So uh, 
So I'll, let me show you two one-dimensional arrays. Uh, one has three items, one has four items. And now I'm going to multiply them together. And this would not work in, uh, it would not work in NumPy, but because I have the, the labels, I know one is on the time axis and one on the, is on the space axis, I know actually they're entirely orthogonal. So I can automatically broadcast them against each other. Um, and I, I don't actually have to worry about like adding in uh, like a dummy dimension of length one to make the, the, uh, the mathematical operations work. Uh, and you can even automatically reorder the dimensions so that so they, they agree because they're labeled. So I can subtract this array from its transpose and, it's, and, it, and it works because even though one object switched the space and time dimensions, when, they, when you add them, you sort of automatically rationalize, you automatically line them up. Um, so that's very convenient. Uh, and we can also do, uh, we can also do alignment on, uh, so like aligning dimensions, you can also align on coordinate values. So this is like what you can do in pandas. Um, but now it works sort of in, in, uh, using the, the same machinery from pandas actually, uh, but it works in multiple dimensions. Uh, so I just made another, another, uh, another array that has similar based on scaling the values in the first array. Um, and so there's, a, uh, re, there's some, a few methods. One is a re-index like, which is, again, just copied from pandas. Um, so I can say I want to take my foo variable and I want to put it on only the, at only the locations where I have values in bar. And it selects them out. So it does, it does all the right slicing. Uh, and I can also go the other way. And if you go the other way, uh, it will fill everything in automatically with missing values with not a number. Um, so you can so you can automatically so you can align very based on these labels you can take care of all the, the uh, aligning all of your uh, your arrays um, and you can also do this there's a we also have a function which lets you do like take combine two arbitrary objects and uh, and, and do and say do an inner join or an outer join uh, again it's a, a, a very similar to this reindex like command but uh, say take the intersection of of, of all of the uh, dimension labels um, and. And both of these work interchangeably with both the, these arrays and with the data set objects. So the data set objects can also be indexed because they have these uh, dimension labels. Uh, all right. So, of course, like I said before, we really want to interoperate with, uh, with pandas and, the whole, and sort of the, the whole PyData ecosystem. So there's a very nice uh, mapping between these data set and data array objects and uh, the native uh, objects in, in, in pandas. So the, the pandas data frame, the pandas series. And the way we do that, again, to remind you, we have this, this data set here, is uh, we're going to take each of the variables in the data set, each of the ones, that, and we're going to make them a column in the data frame. Uh, so if we put this together, we see that I, I end up with this pandas data frame where I have a, uh, a hierarchical index here. It's a, a, called a, a multi-index in pandas. Um, and it's the, sort of the tensor product of the, of, of the uh, of the, uh, of the coordinates that I had along each of my dimensions. Um, and then I have flattened out each of these, uh, each of the arrays into one dimensional object. Uh, so each, each of these, these like three different arrays that I had in my data set is now a column in the data frame. Um, and so now I could pass this off to any number of, of libraries, say to do vi visualization, there, um, uh, or I could pass, or um, sort of, or, any, or pass it off to pandas and use it like any of the pandas data handling tools. Um, uh, directly, and then of course you can get you can get these objects back too. You can take if I, if I have a data frame that's in this in the format where I have where each column corresponds to a variable, and, and I have a multi-index, then uh, to which I want which um, then uh, we can do this this op opposite operation, and you get back a data set. Um, so the only sort of caveat here is is that you may notice that we we had we the my, my, uh, my variables have more dimensions that they had be, than they had before, and that's because to get them in the one-dimensional data frame form, and I had to, to duplicate a lot of the entries. Um, whereas if you have the, the multi-dimensional, the multi-dimensional data set can handle the, um, uh, uh, doesn't need to do as much of duplicating the data. Uh, and so in the same way, we, we can convert things into these pandas series objects. If you want to take a single array, you turn it into a pandas series, which is a, a one-dimensional object. Again, with, with labels and, and essentially the same, the same mechanism. And you can also go in reverse from a pandas series to get back this, the data array. Um, so one thing we were able to do is, uh, again, in an effort to copy everything from pandas and make it work with multidimensional arrays, is uh, copy uh, group by operations. 
So I have uh, an array here with a couple of items, uh, just two different, it's 10 repeated tw twice, and then well, you can see 20 repeated twice. So I can make, make this group by object here on my data set, and it's just, uh, and then I, if I iterate over it, I get back pairs of the, um, of the labels, and then everything that, that is selected by, uh, by that label. So I can see that I, I select out the first half of my data set and then the, the second half of my data set um, along this dimension. And, the, uh, and I can do that for both the data sets and for the data array objects. And then the, the really nice thing about this is you can, is, is the, the group by operation lets you do the, um, this, uh, this, the, there's this split apply combine paradigm for working with data where you can express things like group by these numbers, this num uh, which in this case is a, uh, an array in this data set, and then take the mean and it automatically uh, takes care of that for you. So instead of having to write your own loop to like loop over, uh, to loop over every element that matches the group, um, and, that, and then can cadenate it back together, it's like this is sort of, th this uh, does it all together. And that's a really nice feature of pandas that we copied. Um, and you can also apply, uh, apply functions to uh, different subsets. So for example, here I have a, a standardized function which will take the, um, which will uh, center and, uh, and normalize the data. And I can apply that uh, with a group by to my, uh, to my entire array as well with this apply method. Uh, so that's the group by. Right now it only works for, one -dimensional, for a one-dimensional group, uh, but you could imagine it working, you could imagine it working in, in, like in, in multi-dimensions, so it, gets, it would get a little more complicated. Um, so now I want to talk about, I want to talk about serialization. So, the, the native serialization format for X-Ray is the NetCDF format. Um, so NetCDF is a fully described data format. It's a lot, it's actually, it's, and it's very popular in geosciences. It's a lot like HDF5. You may have heard of, if you've worked with scientific data, HDF5 is very popular. Um, NetCDF is ac the most, well, NetCDF version four, which is sort of the only version you should use if you can, if you can uh, manage, is actually a net, uh, an HDF5 file just following certain conventions. And the main difference is that NetCDF uh, insists that you have to add uh, dimension names to, uh, each of, to each of your arrays. You, you can't have just an array of values. Uh, you, have, you, have to, you have to label it fully. Um, so that's why we're using NetCDF. Um, and so you can export one of these data sets to a NetCDF object, and uh, you can get it back uh, fr from, uh, from something that's on disk. Um, and one nice feature of this is that you actually, you, you get back this data set object, but you haven't actually loaded everything to memory. It's still on disk, and the arrays are still on disk. So I wanna show a demo here. We'll, we'll see if this works, but uh, to load some data from a remote server. So this is using a protocol called OpenDAP, uh, which is a, a way that you can access uh, NetCDF-like data sets over HTTP. Um, so I'm going to open a connection to a, uh, to a server at uh, Columbia University, and you see I get back in a, uh, a data set here, um, which has, uh, I don't know, probably several gigabytes of data. It's, uh, this is a bunch of uh, historical gridded estimates of, of like weather variables like temperature and precipitation um, in the United States. And it's got, well, I mean, you can, you, can, you can see the size of the dimensions. It's about 1,000 by, 1,000 by, 1,400 by 1,400 by 600. So really big, obviously, you know, medium-sized data I'm not going to download it even on Facebook's very fast internet uh, very quickly. So I have, I'm gonna take a look at an array here. Um, and when you have sort of more than a certain number of values on disk, instead of seeing the actual values, I see it just tells me that I have, you know, uh, like a billion values. I, I can't actually count the decimal points there. Um, so I can uh, do things like apply, uh, I'm going to subset the data here and I, I slice it and I still get back another one of these data array objects, and here I took, say, every third element, um, and and now I'll take out, e I'll even further select down, um, and say take the only like the, the first time, and I'm going to do a. If you look at the metadata here, you notice it says something about a, a missing value. So I'm actually, I'm going to fill in these missing values with not a number, um, and uh, and because I access this dot values attribute, it, it sort of it local it cached the uh, the values from this remote data set. As, as a NumPy array locally on, on, on this object. Um, and now I can, I can plot it. Let's see if this works. Um, excellent, so we have a, a nice picture of T-Min for someday in the far distant, in the probably like 1970 or something over, over the United States. 
That's in degrees Celsius, I think. Um, all right. So, um, all right. So I wanted to briefly mention a few sort of things we're, we're, we're working on that hopefully will be in version two of the library, um, or 0.2. Uh, so we haven't yet turned on, you notice I mentioned the automatic alignment for dimensions. Haven't yet turned it on for aligning math between, uh, to aligning uh, coordinate values. So align, if I have like a certain selection of dates in one array and a certain selection of days, dates in another array. Um, and that's because, so pandas makes, uh, has a choice for that where they, they say use all the indices and then to fill everything in with missing values. So you end, up with, you end up with an array with a lot of missing values, which is a pretty reasonable choice for pandas especially when you're working with low dimensional data. Because in the worst case scenario, you end up with, uh, with, with an object back that is only twice the size, or really the, the, the sum of the sizes of, of the two arrays you put in. Um, if you have multi-dimensional objects, you could end up with a lot, like, you know, uh, very large uh, arrays coming back with missing values. Uh, so that seems like probably less useful. So we may, I, I'm inclined to do, to default to trying to do like an, an inner join to avoid memory issues. Um, Right now, we don't have a constructor to make a data array directly. You have to make a data set first. And I think there might be, uh, if we can figure out a, a, nice, a nice way to do that, I, I would like to be able to make data, data arrays directly um, instead of taking them from pandas. Um, there's still a lot of features from pandas that we'd like to copy, especially for handling like missing values um, that we just haven't sort of gotten around to, to dealing with yet. But think, um, and so one last uh, big aspect would be, uh, allowing us to, to incrementally write these objects to, to disk so that I can uh, process an array and I can write out like a, a chunk of the array to, uh, to, a, to a file on disk and then and, uh, do that um, repeatedly so I don't have to put everything into memory. Um, all right, so I had a few, a few thoughts about sort of based on my experience with, with uh, X-Ray for sort of the PyData audience. And the first thing was that you don't really need heterogeneous data types in your arrays if you have the right sort of containers. So pandas, you can have every, if you think, maybe it's, it's an indication that you shouldn't really think of a, of a data frame as being a two-dimensional as being a two-dimensional array of values. Maybe it's more useful to think of it as a container of one-dimensional arrays in the same way that the X-ray data set is a container of n-dimensional arrays. Um, in that sense, you don't necessarily need heterogeneous data types um, in your arrays. And uh, so, yes, and we based all this, a lot of the tricky computation on this, the pandas index object, which turned out to be a real pleasure to work with and sort of did, uh, worked very quickly. And the, the last, last point is that out of core computation will obviously be sort of really impactful when, uh, when it's sort of linked up to all these libraries um, for like scientific computing. So that, uh, all right, that's it. So I wanted to briefly thank my, a few of my coworkers at Clinton Corporation who have uh, contributed to X-Ray or have tested it, um, and you for listening. Uh, yeah, so, so two questions, if I can. Uh, so one, what's the status of, of out-of-core right now? Are you just depending on that CDF? Or is that like still in the wait, in the works? Yeah, so we don't really have good support for out of, I mean, no, nothing for like out, for out of core computation. And the, we can load data lazily from a NetCDF file, um, but we can't write data lazily yet. That's something that I intend to do shortly. Uh, are you familiar, <laughs> I'm not actually, don't know much, I don't know much about this, but are you familiar with, with like NumPy memmapped? Is that sufficient? That's a good question, and I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. Okay. I mean, that, that, gives you num, that gives you NumPy like semantics over blobs yeah, of binary data and, and on disk. Yeah, I, I think that the, the one aspect that we would like is, uh, I mean, we, we would like to be able to incrementally write to, uh, to, to a NetCDF file, actually, because it's, then it's fully self-described. We could define our own sort of on disk file format that's like NumPy arrays plus, I don't know, maybe a JSON file of metadata, but that seems less uh, than ideal. Granted. Uh, second question, if I can. Uh, so why, I don't understand why all of the data sets need to, why all the, um, labeled arrays need to live in the same data set. Uh, couldn't you register, uh, when you do sort of cross array computations, can you just register based off of some shared token in the dimensions? Yes, so they don't need to live in the same data set, in fact. In, 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 yes, uh, I guess I showed that in this talk, but, but in, you absolutely do not need to have your arrays in the same data set. You can make, as long as the dimension names match up and the coordinate values line up, you can use arrays from different data sets. 
Um, really, the data set is just a way of organizing it. When I have, if I have information that's all along the same dimensions, then yes, put it all in one data set. But in general, we, and we have a lot of code where we're like, we like make like multiple data sets and then we will we'll combine uh, and compare from different data sets. Hey, I was uh, wondering, did you, maybe you went over this and I missed it, but mm -hmm. uh, does this cover sparse data? Uh, not, no, at this point. <laughs> okay. yeah, although, but... although uh, I would love to add you know, support for sparse data. I think it could fit very easily into this. Okay, and I'm assuming that your underlying data structure is, is an ND array or very similar to an ND array, right, yes. for each dimension? Yes, in fact. I, basically, once you, load, once you load data from, I mean, from disk, or from wherever you're, you're getting it from. It's, it's stored internally, it's cached as, as, as a NumPy array, yes. A, a dense NumPy array. What kind of computation would be possible on, on disk? Uh, I assume you can increment or add values to arrays that are on disk, can you do like linear algebra on a disk? What what are the what what is your goal for that kind of thing? Well, I mean, my hope right now is not to try. I'm not going to try to do very complicated computations in here because that, well, to, to do like lazy computation. But I, I do want to again like add like incremental writes because that's sort of essential to doing that. Um, ultimately, it would be wonderful to be able to say, I have you know one data set that's on disk, I'm going to do a bunch of, I don't know, at least apply some number of like, of like mathematical operations. Maybe it's relatively simple things, like I'm going to take like a mean, or I'm going to like aggregate it in some, some you know, in some simple way, say, to subset it down to maybe a more reasonable data set, or like, or tweak it in a few ways, and then write it out to disk. That, that seems probably feasible. I mean, you're, you're probably not going to do a, you know, to run a machine learning algorithm with the array on, you know, uh, on disk in a lazy fashion. But simple things, yes. All right, let's thank Stefan.